It's still months before college football season kicks off. But the team at Northwestern University is in the middle of a 40-hour work week. They are traveling more than even 10 years ago. They are being asked to sacrifice more. They are asked to treat their sport as a year-round endeavor. So the demands on them are so intense that it has put them in a situation where it's like a, a fight or die kind of a situation. Players earn no pay other than a scholarship to attend class. For their coach, Pat Fitzgerald, that's compensation enough. I'm a football coach, I'm a teacher, I'm an educator. Right. This isn't uh, what I signed up to be. I signed up to help these guys develop to be the best they can be, um, not, not to be an employer, you know? But in January, his players demanded to be considered employees, becoming the first college team to seek a union. Guys come in here and bash all day, and then they're injured five years down the road, and they get nothing. Right now, athletes don't receive long-term medical care and can't collect a paycheck or form a union. The National Collegiate Athletic Association, or NCAA, sets the rules for college sports. But those rules could soon be overturned. Fault Lines investigates the multi-billion dollar business of college football, the players who produce that wealth, and their demands for a more equitable game. You know, I just hope, you know, the NCAA does understand that, you know, some things do need to change. Hey. The first thing right behind me, you guys see our lovely bookstore, lots of orange apparel. You guys all got coupons for that, 10% off. Head in there afterwards. Today is Solid Orange Friday, which is a little bit of a tradition in Tigertown with anybody who has attended Clemson. We all like to show our orange um, around Clemson on Friday. If you want to become a part of this family, get your orange today. We're joined along with a tour of uh, the Clemson campus here, but we're following Abby, who's a sophomore, and she clearly loves Clemson. And a couple times throughout the tour, college football has come up as being a big part of the life here. It's actually a $40 million enterprise for the school. Now, the part of the tour that you've probably all been waiting for, if you guys look right through here, you can see Death Valley. Who has been to a game in Death Valley? Raise your hand. Clemson University has one of the 25 most lucrative football programs in the country spring game tomorrow and so it's really great because a lot of people have been waiting for Clemson football to start back up and it's not abnormal for a lot of our season ticket holders or alum to travel to come for that game even though it's just Clemson against Clemson. One of those alums is Darius Robinson who just played his last season at Clemson. Yeah, I'm about at my end of my uh, tolerance level right now. Darius is playing professional football now, but making it there was a financial struggle. I came from a household to where, you know, both of my parents didn't go to school. You know, so we didn't necessarily have the type of income to provide my sister with a good education and be able to help me out whenever I needed money. His scholarship didn't cover the cost of living, so he started a business in college. But when he began using his name and image to promote it, the school shut it down. You know, there's so many rules that are saying what we can't do, you know, and in my mind, I had the mindset, like, what can we do? You know, like, everything in the rule about student athlete cannot do this, cannot do that, cannot do this, cannot do that. What about what a student athlete can do? NCAA rules prevent current athletes from making money off of their fame. Darius is part of a class action lawsuit to overturn that ban. We've been working hard our whole lives. We've been doing this since we were six and seven years old. So for someone to say that because you're a student athlete, you can't, you can't even promote yourself and be who you are because you're a student athlete, you know, I find that very disrespectful. It's game day, and on Main Street, the football economy is in high gear. The Clemson Tiger Paw is one of the highest grossing logos in college sports. And it's the players who draw the crowd. I have number two, and I'll bet you, I'll look over here, yeah, number 10. Those are the jerseys worn by Clemson's star players, Sammy Watkins and Taj Boyd. All of this, this merchandise, is a $4 billion a year industry. And now that Taj and Sammy are not actually college football players anymore, but they're getting ready for the NFL draft, they, they can now make some money off of this. And today, they're actually here in the store uh, signing autographs for $30.
And there is a line out the door of this door of people waiting to get their autograph. I am such a fan of yours, Todd. Um, we have our sweats, we have ties, we have hats, we have bags, we have flip flops, we have watches, we have flags, we have wallets, we have keychains, we have jewelry, we have everything down to night lights, to stuffed animals, to sink stoppers. I've had a, I have a guitar, I have drumsticks. So. Would you like to see the players, like say Sammy and Todd, get some of the money from the jerseys that have number two and number ten sold on them? If that happened from a business standpoint, we would have to jack up our prices. What are the ends of the NCAA? On one hand, there's a very easy answer to that, and that has to do with profit. And that has to do with who controls the incredible amounts of money that are produced by college athletics in this country. We are talking billions and billions of dollars. The NCAA did not agree to an on-camera interview but replied to questions by email. The organization says it spends about $200 million each year on scholarships for athletes like Darius. But to get that scholarship, Darius had to sign away his commercial rights to the NCAA. If you guys have even watched Clemson football on TV, you've probably seen this. The tradition is that all the players come, get off the bus, and then they run down our green grassy hill. Everybody's jumping up and down. There are fireworks going off, cannons. Everybody's yelling, screaming. There's nothing like being in there with 80,000 of your closest friends. In less than two decades, the NCAA's assets have increased by nearly 1,000%. The entire economy, the t-shirts, ticket sales, and TV deals relies on the player on the field. Now players are suing for a share. We're the marketers. We are the ones marketing the Nike here at Clemson, the Paul. You know, we have on a Nike chase. We make people like, ooh, Dad, I want those Nike gloves. I want those Nike cleats. Matter of fact, can I get them in orange and can I buy them from Clemson? You know? First down orange team at the 40. Do you know now what you gave away in signing the letter of intent? Yeah, absolutely. I definitely understand now, you know, what I gave away. And that was pretty much who I was. I became, you know, in a sense, you know, in some people's eyes, you know, I still I, I always feel like I'm a person, but in some people's eyes, I became more of a Clemson's possession. Meanwhile, the college football boom has been good to Clemson. The school has committed $170 million in a decade to expand its stadium and practice facilities. Corporate fingerprints are all over this game. Up on the electronic banner behind me, you can see it, it says Verizon. But we've also seen TDY Bank, UPS, Coca-Cola, and Nike. Nike, in fact, is not just up on the banners. It's on every single player's uniform and on their shoes. Number 91, Josh Watson. We're bringing a lot of profit in this city alone. You know, so the fact that we're putting our lives on the line, you know, it's people out there that are actually dying from this, you know, being able to never walk again, you know. Coach Dabo Sweeney enjoys celebrity status, and his opinions can sway the fan base. And what we try to teach our guys is use football uh, to, you know, create the opportunities, take advantage of the platform and the brand and the marketing that you have available to you. But as far as paying players, professionalizing college athletics, that's where you lose me. Uh, I'll go do something else because, uh, you know, there's enough entitlement in this world as it is. Coach Sweeney just signed an eight-year contract that will pay $3 million next season. Meanwhile, a recent study shows that 86% of college athletes live below the federal poverty line. The reason why we are at a breaking point is that you currently have two economies existing side by side in one structure. Because you have the coaches are like the wolfiest wolves of Wall Street. So it's free market run amok. You know, Ayn Rand would weep with joy at the economic situation for the coaches. But for the players, it's indentured servitude. You know, all I know is, is college football is, is, is a, a great, great opportunity. It's, it's one of the, late, the last great things in America that's still teaching young people how to think right, hard work, sacrifice. You know, it is in a way, you know, set up as the modern slavery as the regards to, you know, the type of work that we do, you know, what our body goes through and the type of money that we're bringing in for what we do.
You gonna be the quarterback? Come on. The battle inside college football is over more than profits. That's what you gonna tell the coach? Athletes want their safety concerns addressed. That's what you gonna play? Adrian Arrington's career at Eastern Illinois University did not lead to the NFL. In fact, due to his health problems, Adrian can't hold down a job at all. Did they teach you how to hit safely? In college, I never had no drills in like where you got to form, tackle, and do stuff like that. But did they ever talk to you about how to? hit people safely? So after my concussion and things like that, I've never had nobody like, oh, Adrian, you need to stop hitting like this or nothing like that. Noel Lucero met Adrian in college when his concussions began to trigger seizures. To be honest, I don't even remember the first time because there's been so many, but he had one in our bed. And at the time, you know, we had um, nightstands on either side and he was having one and he fell off and hit his shoulder on the nightstand and his head was banging on the nightstand while he's having the seizure so I'm moving everything out of the way and just trying to put towels under his head and um, he had bit his lip so it was bleeding. Adrian is the lead plaintiff in a class action lawsuit seeking damages from the NCAA. He owes more than $100,000 in medical bills the NCAA has not offered Adrian long-term medical care. When it was really going on in college, I honestly thought I was losing my mind. I, I honestly thought I was losing my mind because I will never remember that. People would come up to me, you know you got in a bar fight? I'm like, what is you talking about? Like, I don't remember that. Like, like most of the time when I had seizures and stuff, I don't remember the situation, but when people come up and say st certain stuff to me, it's like, ooh, this is really scary. Like, this is crazy. Back to the days of Roosevelt, really, when the NCAA was first created, there's this mandate of uh, protecting the student athlete and you know safeguarding the uh, the health and well-being of the student athlete. His lawyer, Joe Siprit, says safety concerns inside college football are nothing new. I mean, so we're basically saying, well, wait a minute, you know, what happened to that idea? Excuse me, how you doing? Uh, Jamie told me to come in between 10 and 11. Okay. According to the NCAA, more than a third of all concussions in college sports happen on the football field. This is the most people I've seen in here, this. The NCAA denies it is legally responsible for the long-term safety of college athletes. It claims the schools are liable. Schools, like Adrian's alma mater, Eastern Illinois. That coach came to my house and sat down in my house and told my mom and my daddy, we want your kid to come to this school. We want to take care of your child. So football really was your, your gateway to a four-year degree? Mm-hmm, and that's why I worked so hard at football because coming from a family that had didn't have much and, and living in homeless shelter, living in housing authority, I, I felt like that was going to be the only way I could just pay for college on my own and not stress my parents out. You were pretty successful at Eastern Illinois, right? Mm-hmm. I was a captain, uh, you know what I'm saying? I, was, I, I felt that I did whatever my coaches wanted to do in terms of a player. And, and I, was, I was having a good time at Eastern until my concussions and, and, the, and the bad health situations came up. Did you talk to the coaching staff? Yeah, I talked to the coaching staff and, I, and, and they just said, take a cup when you get, come back in a few days, you'll be fine, you know what I'm saying? Take the, these uh, pills called Kepra, and, uh, and then they just said, as long as you take your medicine, you'll be allowed to play. And, but this still kept going on uh, throughout my career. He had head injury after head injury after head injury. And each time, he was involved in situations where uh, the coaches didn't pull him out of the game. Uh, he was put back in where his, his own father uh, pulled him off on the sidelines and said, Adrian, are you OK? Didn't even recognize him. He was still ready to go back in the game and play. Were the coaches going to put you back in the game? Mm-hmm. They was going to put me back in the game. And my dad had to come from the bleachers, they say, and tell them not to put me back in the game that's how impaired he was. And so that happened a few too many times. So that just tends to be my When Arrington played, the NCAA had no specific return to play rule, probably because of requiring schools to keep players with concussions on the sidelines. It takes at least three or four hours, it said, for the symptoms of a concussion to heal. And oftentimes much more than that. 
the interesting thing about that is that last time I checked, the football game was three or four hours. Mm. So what, what that alone means is that there are really no circumstances in which someone who has sustained a concussion during a game can ever go back in during the game. Did Eastern Illinois have a uh, protocol or requirements in place? It couldn't have been a, a, a protocol if you if I get a concussion in the game and you put me right back in the game to where my dad has to take me out of the game and not you guys. It can't be a protocol. But that changed after Arrington graduated. In 2010, the NCAA required schools to develop guidelines for concussion safety. But Arrington's suit alleges that this safety mandate was designed to be weak. Some of these emails are, are kind of shocking, and I would call them smoking guns. Internal NCAA emails show former head of safety David Klossner pushing for more stringent safety rules and facing pushback from inside the organization. Very interesting uh, email here again from David Klossner where he says, return same day issues seems to be our biggest barrier. I have yet to find legitimate data to show same day return to play is a good thing. Klossner's the one in here that keeps bringing up the idea of rules about returning to play and about the safety of this and what an issue it is. I've been pretty busy with work getting ready for meetings and trying to get Dave Klossner off my back. That dude wears me out. So the one guy that's raising the, the, the red flag here is getting shut out? Shut down, suppressed, and criticized. I think it's a, 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 a big lie and a big facade that the uh, NCAA is putting on to say that we are here with the commercials they have on every day. We hear our main priority is the student athletes and their health. That's a lie. The NCAA has not investigated any school for violating its safety rules. At least in the case of the NFL players, they're professional athletes who are being paid millions of dollars, and they have lawyers, they have agents, they have a union, uh, they have all sorts of people protecting their interests vis-a-vis uh, -vis, you know, the NFL and, and the ownership. At the college level, the players have none of that. The NCAA says student athlete safety is a priority and is in settlement talks with Adrian's lawyers. I just pray it doesn't get worse looking at these other football players that had similar injuries. You know, I don't want him to get Alzheimer's when he's 35 or, you know, some... It's just a... I try not to think about it. We're north of Chicago, where safety concerns drove players at Northwestern University to seek a union. It's the day of the vote, and we're going to meet Chris Gradone, the team's senior punter. Hey, good morning. How's it going? Good. Good. Yeah, nice hey, I'm Josh. How are you doing, Zach? Nice to meet you, nice Zach. To meet you, sir. Yeah, you ready for today? Yeah, it feels kind like of a so. historic day. Yeah, it really is. In January, nearly every player on the team signed a petition supporting a union vote. But by April, their coach had chipped away at that support. Did you know where you were on the issue before he called you in? No, I didn't. You were kind of up in the air? Yeah. You it were was, a swing vote. Exactly, yeah. It's like he was like personally uh, like almost offended that this whole thing's going on at his school. Mm -hmm. um, that he, that's not what he wanted. And that, that was actually a, a decent motivation for me to, to not want the union. The fact that you wouldn't want to disappoint your coach? Yeah, like I feel like he's just He's gotten me so much. He like, like got me in the school and got me a scholarship. Like, I owe the guy a lot. This is, this is the kind of case that could go to the Supreme Court. Gary Coleman is the player's lawyer. He cross-examined Coach Fitzgerald at a labor board hearing this winter. He allowed me, because he was forthright and candid, to just walk through, not day by day, but hour by hour, almost the life of a, an athlete on the football program. And then uh, at the end of it, I asked him, after I'd build all these things up, isn't it true that uh, being a college football player is a full-time job? And it was the first time that he pushed back and he said no. And I said, well, that's interesting because I have an article here in the Chicago Tribune in which you said two years ago that being a college football player was a full-time job. Did you say that? And he said yes. Even if you guys vote no, that now the precedent is set for other schools. Yeah, that was another part of the message was that. And I think that was big as far as like why we started it in the first place. 
Have you heard anything from the administration that like negative consequences could be if you were to vote a union in, you may not get to go home on emergency leave to see your family? I don't necessarily Does that make believe, sense? believe that tactic. Um, but they, they have kind of said that if a union is brought in, all of the benefits we get now are kind of taken away and then rebargained for. So we might not get them back and we could actually lose benefits. There have been some allegations by union supporters that Northwestern engaged in unfair labor practices during the election campaign. That is simply not true. You know, we point with great pride to the fact that if you look at our football team, we have a 97% graduation rate, the best in the country. It's also a school that's aggressively anti-union when it comes to grad student teachers, custodians, and all the rest of it. And so they, they, were, they were not going to roll over uh, for the athletes if they wanted to unionize. It's putting Northwestern on the wrong side of history. Because Some ex-Northwestern players formed a group to advocate for current athletes. Kevin Brown played for the Wildcats from 1981 to 1985. When you look at the NCAA um, and Northwestern is a part of this, so there's no distinction, well, that's an NCAA issue. It's, no, we, you're a part of the association. So it's your issue as well. It's not just, it's them. No, it's us. We've been talking and saying the same thing. Alex Moyer was his teammate and went pro. Same thing when, when we, were, we were going to school in the mid 80s and before. So as Kevin said, just to say, we'll take care of you, um, after a while, that just rings kind of hollow. Players are being exploited. We all know that. And the question is, uh, what is it going to take to correct that? But it is, it is a fact. The players' ballots were not counted and the election results not released. The school and the union are battling over whether the players are employees under the law. That ruling will be made by the National Labor Relations Board in Washington, D.C. This idea that started with Kane Coulter in a classroom at Northwestern has now grown much, much larger. House Republicans have called hearings about it today in Congress. We share the concerns of players that progress is too slow, but forming a union is not the answer. It is simply the wrong way to go to address these very important issues. The number of questions that are raised are so myriad. They are just remarkably wide-ranging. Would a union negotiate over the number and length of practices? Perhaps a union would seek to bargain over the number of games. If management and the union are at an impasse, would players go on strike? Are these schools ready to make some difficult decisions such as cutting support to other athletic programs like lacrosse and field hockey or even raising tuition. The list of grievances that these players presented is the list of grievances that players could have presented five years ago and ten years ago across the college community, but they haven't been addressed. Whether or not you have the, the, the security of a scholarship for how long, whether or not you're going to have health insurance, stipends, transfers. We've been over this. We've been over this and over this and over this. It's bringing us into a sea of complete uncertainty. Northwestern University and the NCAA both say that the players' union effort will end up in the Supreme Court. Now, I'm not saying that the NCAA created institutional racism and poverty in the United States, but the NCAA consciously benefits. Which one's dead? Because they put these players from a particular background in a position where rocking the boat is lethal for their opportunities to be able to pull their family out of poverty. The NCAA itself has acknowledged that the Division I basketball and Division I football are all about maximizing profits. I mean, you know, there's no secret anymore. I mean, you know, the curtain has been pulled back. They're generating an insane amount of money. They're being told what they can or cannot eat, what they can or cannot study. And it's just, it's reached a breaking point. There's no moral center anymore. The center will not hold. The center is not holding. When there's no controlling moral authority, and right now there is no controlling moral authority, uh, the, the, the system can no longer exist. <laughs>